I'll go ahead and get started. We might have some more people joining as we go. Um, so my name is Sarah Allison and I'm the Recreation Coordinator with Horse Council BC. I would like to acknowledge that the land where the HCBC office is located is on the traditional lands of the Katsi, Kwantlen, Matsqui, and Sami Amu First Nations. Myself and many others are attending virtually from other areas in British Columbia. Therefore, we'd like to acknowledge all the Aboriginal peoples whose traditional territories we are meeting today. And I'm just gonna go over um, some housekeeping just as before we get started. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that this presentation is being recorded and it'll be available for people to watch at a later date. Um, since we have everyone on mute that we ask if you have a question, just to please put it in the chat box. And at the end of the presentation, we will go over some questions. And we'll try and keep it keep the presentation to about an hour and my coworker Jocelyn here is here as well to help with the technology and um, to help monitor the chat box for the questions. All right, so Neil Arison is our presenter and he is joining us today to talk about the safe system approach and road safety and its relevance to equestrian safety. Neil has worked in the field of road safety research for many years and has contributed to numerous publications and studies. He is also the author of the book, No Accident, Eliminating Injury and Death on the Canadian Roads. And before we get started, um, we have a couple of poll questions and we would appreciate taking the time to answer. Um, Jocelyn, if you don't mind putting up the first poll and we'll give everybody um, a chance to answer. Okay, great. Um, and we'll go ahead with the second poll if everybody has had a chance. Okay, perfect. So thank you for everybody for completing the polls. And now I will pass it over to Neil and we'll get started with the presentation. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, yeah, I'll just go and share my screen now. Okay, um, can you see that okay? Yeah, you're good, Neil. Yeah. I can see it on my and end. You can hear me fine and all that too? Yeah, you're good. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for your time and interest in road safety, um, especially uh, with regard to horse and rider. And um, so I'm just gonna kind of, it's a bit of a whirlwind kind of tour of road safety. Um, that I'm going to take you on in about 45 minutes because I think we're going to save some time for questions at the end. So it'll be kind of rapid fire, <laughs> cover a whole bunch of stuff here. A lot of principles around of road safety that relate to, um, you know, people, cars, bicyclists, et cetera. But we're going to come back to a lot of these principles actually are very applicable because there's only so many fundamental principles behind road safety. So they're all going to relate to the sector that you're, you're all interested in. Um, so we're going to call we're going to talk about the road safety problem just so we're all kind of grounded the safe system approach in road safety which is the world's uh, leading thinking in road safety and then some of those principles touch on road ecology which is a kind of a new field and then i'll leave you with some kind of um uh takeaways that with respect to the sector that you're in um just got to jive my uh my two um two screens here trying to be high tech okay um 
so the road safety problem, of course, is a big one. It kills 1.35 million people a year in the world. That's 3,600 people a day. And there's really large differences between countries, uh, like bad performers and good performers. So we know that uh, uh, there's tons of room for improvement. Uh, generally, there is a lack of priority. You know, you don't hear about road safety given a big priority that much. A little bit more actually these days, but generally still compared to the size of the problem, uh, not that much. And when we look at world data from the World Health Organization, you know, it's actually a growing problem. The number of people killed um, is slated to projected to grow to 2060. Um, and here in Canada, if we actually look at, if we combine deaths from assault, terrorism and war, we get about 15% of the people uh, killed in road crashes. We know that in Canada and BC, in our context, that uh, road crash fatalities are about double that of the world's best performers. So countries like the Netherlands, Norway, et cetera. Um, and that we're making the least amount of progress with respect to vulnerable road users. Now, vulnerable road users is basically anybody outside of a motor vehicle. So a, a cyclist, a pedestrian, a flag person directing traffic, and of course, equestrians, people who ride horses or those who drive a horse and cart, including its passengers. These are all uh, vulnerable road users. And it's important today, I think, to focus on the vulnerable road users because it's actually where we're seeing, again, the least amount of progress. Um, and of course, they're by definition, they're just the most vulnerable group. Um, in this, in among vulnerable uh, road users, we find uh, disproportionate impacts on vulnerable populations. Uh, there's a very high risk when we measure it like distance uh, kilometers traveled or per trip, uh, it's extraordinarily high. But the other thing is when we actually focus on, on improving this, uh, the system for vulnerable road users, it actually improves safety for everybody. So it's pretty much a win-win thing. Um, and then there's this whole concept which started in the Netherlands, um, uh, Sweden, of Vision Zero, and it's a it's basically the idea that um, we're gonna we can eliminate not all crashes but deaths and serious injuries, um, and uh, it's actually so doable that this organization in in Germany, Decra, started this interactive map which actually shows cities um, with populations of 50,000 and higher that have actually achieved Vision Zero. Uh, and then in 2020, um, Helsinki and Oslo essentially, and these are large cities, 600,000 and 1.1 million people, um, actually achieved it. Uh, no pedestrian uh, cyclist deaths and like one car uh, driver death. So the whole thinking is that in every situation, a person might fail, but the road system should not. That's kind of like the fundamental premise behind um, uh, Vision Zero and safe system thinking. And part of that is when you kind of chronicle all of the things that go wrong for humans, humans are very fallible. They make mistake, they, mistakes, they do egregious things. When you kind of, all of these things on this list, there's about 60 items, I think, they all increase the relative risk of a crash. So it's kind of hard to improve road safety if we think we're just gonna change people. We can make a dent, it can make it some difference, but it's kind of the tough way to go. Um, and the Australians have shown this too, you know, despite what you hear in the media, their research showed that um, about 60% of fatalities and 90% of serious injuries are actually just from ordinary people making ordinary mistakes. So what we, what the system calls for instead is when you look at the layers, like we have drivers and roads and vehicles and behaviors, and they're all imperfect. We want to make them more perfect. But where there are gaps in all of them, um, that's where a serious injury or a death can line up, can kind of get through the system. And so under safe system thinking, we want to plug those holes so that it makes it very, very difficult for a serious injury or death to get through. Um, so the outdated view is that road crashes are just unfortunate accidents that happen. There's little we can do, but the modern view is based on science. Road crashes are system failures and a particularly injury um, and death from them or system failures that can be systematically um, addressed. And then we're just gonna go through like some of the principles and these principles, we're gonna go through principles of urban road design and then rural road design. Um, but they're both, you might think rural is more applicable 
and it is, but actually there's a lot of principles from the urban side that apply as well. Um, so again, there these are kind of put together, um, um, you know, for general road use safety. But we're, there's going to be lots of takeaways uh, for your sector. So the five principles around urban road design: well, you need to have basic infrastructure like sound fundamental engineering principles. You need to reduce speed, separate vulnerable road users through space and time. Uh, do real-time kind of nudging to support decision-making and then shift modes. Because if we get more people out of cars and onto bikes and horses, we'll actually make the system safer. Um, so the, there's all kinds of things and we won't go through all of the things that form basic infrastructure, but, you know, um, bike sidewalks that don't end, you know, uh, drainage systems that work properly, a lack of obstructions, of course, these are all bad things. Here again, you have an obstructed uh, pedestrian. Uh, and these again, apply you know, at a horse crossing, for example, like this one, because sight lines are fundamental uh, part of engineering. If you have a corner with it, or, a, or a grade or a curve, um, the driver needs to be able to see up ahead. And that doesn't always happen, despite the fact that it's um, a fundamental engineering principle. Uh, the Broncos tragedy in, Sask in uh, Saskatchewan, um, sight lines were actually identified as a factor and they since removed trees, for example, um, in that situation. The next uh, principle is reduce speeds. Well, speeds are huge. Um, we know that when we reduce uh, speeds, we have shorter stopping distances and less kinetic energy released in a crash. Also drivers, they are, their effective field of vision is actually wider. They see more of the road. Uh, research shows that they're actually more likely to stop for other road users like pedestrians or people on horses when they're traveling at lower speeds. Um, and uh, Rune Elvik in, uh, in Norway, who is a leader in road safety research, uh, summed it up quite simply after reviewing hundreds of studies. When speeds go up, deaths and injuries go up. And when speeds go down, deaths and injuries go down. This is this uh, poster from the UK county of Lancashire says that I'm seven times more likely to die if you hit me at 30 miles per hour versus 20, which is pretty close to the difference between uh, 50 and 30 kilometers an hour. Um, and this, this lines up exactly with the research, um, you know, about five to eight times higher likelihood of death when a pedestrian is struck at 50 versus 30K. And there's lots of ways to reduce speeds, you know, traffic calming, et cetera, or simply reducing speed limits. Where I live, Victoria, reduced its speed limits in 2014, or this is a, a chicane. Um, so there's obstructions in the, or sidewalk bulges that kind of alternate left to right, kind of makes it hard to go fast, right? On a road like that, or, you know, um, a raised pedestrian crossing is like a speed hump, but right where people cross the street. Um, or another treatment is uh, transverse rumble strips. You know, you probably have uh, driven on these when you approach the ferry, at least on uh, Swartz Bay side, we have these. And they, you know, you start, your vehicle shakes and rumbles and you know that the road is telling you something that you want to, you need to slow down. So more measures than just signs. We also know that narrow roads and streets make people drive slower. The wider people think it used to be that, well, we make roads wide and that they're safer, but we make them wide and people uh, want to travel faster is the psychology. And even at turns, you know, we built roads back in the 50s that uh, have really wide turning radius. And that created two problems. One is it makes it so that cars can go fast on a corner. It also makes it so that pedestrians are more vulnerable. They're exposed to traffic because the distance they have to traverse is longer. But, you know, people are starting to change this. This is actually Manila in the Philippines where they're building a huge, where they built a huge sidewalk bulge to address both of those problems, reduce speeds and reduce the uh, potential for conflict. Or, you know, in this situation, you can see, you know, everything of the characteristics of the env total environment just speak to slowness from the, obviously uh, the type of surface, road surface, the narrowness, the grade, um, the features, et cetera. Uh, and we know that 30 kilometers an hour is, is a good speed anytime 
motor tr vehicle traffic mixes with vulnerable road users, so including equestrians and horses. And this is actually a pretty good, um, um, looks like a pretty good road. You know, it's narrow, it's gravel. It's, obviously, we don't see a lot of traffic. It's probably not uh, got high volumes of traffic, and it certainly does have a 30 kilometer an hour speed limit. The third principle is uh, really important too. I guess maybe my favorite after reduced speeds, and that is we have to separate vulnerable road users from traffic, and we can do that in two ways, through time and space. And we all know these actually what they are, you know. We don't separate them in time when uh, we actually allow vehicles to turn left or right at the same time the pedestrians can cross. I don't know why we do that. They actually don't do this in Europe. Um, and it gives rise to huge numbers of um, injuries. Instead, we wanna have dedicated uh, traffic flows where only one thing is allowed to happen at a time. We know from lots of research that the human brain can't process uh, a, a huge amounts of information uh, like is required when you're making complex uh, left and right turns with traffic and people, et cetera. Um, another one for pedestrians is just giving them a head start. So it's all red in four directions and then the pedestrians only have a seven or eight second head start or, or it's all red and only pedestrians can cross. We used to do that. This is uh, Granville and Hastings in the 1950s. But then we started to rip these out all across North America because we, the focus became throughputs and speeds. How much traffic could we get through per hour and how fast we could get it. So we would rip these out, but they've they're making a comeback, pedestrian scrambles like this one in Victoria, the first in Victoria, um, are, are making a comeback around the world. And again, um, dedicated crossings, you know, like this one uh, in the UK, it's activated, uh, the signal head is actually two meters above ground, so it's, it's an appropriate height, so a person on a, a rider on a horse can, doesn't have to get off their horse to push that button and then activate the, um, the crossing. We can also do separation through space. So, right, when we just simply separate vulnerable road users uh, through space. I haven't done a very good job of that here. This is a pedestrian crossing, but again, you've got that uh, large turning radius and huge distance to cross. So again, we have that same problem of uh, faster speeds and, and more con, uh, larger conflict zone. So in effect, a poor separation of space. <clears throat> Better here with sort of low cost measures that reduce the crossing distance, you know, suggest to drivers that there's something going on here. Um, actually, they even uh, nudge drivers to reduce their speed and, and, and prevent vehicles from parking there and actually uh, acting as a sight line obstruction as well. Churchill curb, you know, same thing. It just brings a lot of more presence to the fact that there's a pedestrian crossing um, and it shortens the crossing as well. Similar measures like these, uh, sidewalk bulges and median islands, or even the, this is a new mini roundabout in a residential area. So we can see that again, those two things are accomplished, reduced speeds and smaller conflict zones. Pedestrian, uh, a cycleway or a Bicycle path or, or bike lane, sorry, is another way that we separate, you know, vulnerable road users from traffic. And uh, that's being done, you know, uh, in rural remote areas too. Um, like this one is the 40 kilometer segment from Tofino to Uculet on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. This is a multi-use path under construction involving the townships of Tofino, Uculet, but also Parks Canada. So it'll entice more people to, you know, use it. It'll be safer and, um, and uh, bring all kinds of benefits when it's uh, completed, I think next year. And then again, separation through space. Well, if we don't have cars, we have trails um, and roads that are not conducive to, to vehicle traffic. Uh, you know, obviously this is better. Um, and, you know, you can see right to the kinds of trails that we probably wanna be on, uh, but it's not always practical. Sometimes we have to use uh, roads, um, but that would certainly be the ideal. And then the fourth principle is highly supported and nudged decision-making. So supporting drivers to make decisions um, in real time, like a vivid crosswalk that brings attention um, or a rapid rectangular flashing lights at a crosswalk. Um, these are the rectangular rapid, rapid uh, ones are really bright 
almost as bright as an emergency vehicle's uh, lights. Um, or the zigzag markings uh, shown here, which are actually from the UK, but and here, here they've actually trialed it in uh, Virginia, the US, and they showed their engineering report showed a really, really good effect. So this is just those, you know, the lines that start to uh, go zigzag. You can see the yellow one and the white one as if they approach the stop sign. And again, it's really just nudging, right? It's just, um, it's just the change of, of, uh, of uh, direction of the paint. It's all it is. It's just communicating that something is going on here. You need to pay attention. Pretty soon you see enough of these, you know what they mean. So instead of just putting up a lone stop sign, we can do a lot more than that, right? We can have zigzag markings. We could have transverse rumble strips, et cetera. Um, it makes me think of the humble crash in Saskatchewan. Again, just to go back to that, so many young people killed and it was just a lonely stop sign. That's all it was, there was nothing else. Um, or in this case, um, an in-pavement sign, you know, these are about $400, but they actually, they are shown to work. Or even the uh, placement of the stop line, putting it further away from the crossing. You can see again, all of these principles could be applied to a horse crossing. It's no different, right? Uh, having the stop line further in advance uh, actually provides safety. Drivers are more likely to stop. They do more scanning of the roadway. They can actually see more when they're stopped. And again, the Pegasus uh, road crossing in the UK. Um, and this one you can see, um, it's kind of neat because you can see that um, um, you've got the zigzag markings. You've just got all kinds of features, right? That are, you know, it's not just a lonely sign. You can see a number of uh, signal heads as well. Um, so this was, they actually did a non-slip rubber surface as well. And they actually have a, um, an advanced yellow as well, you know, to warn that there's a, a, a crossing up ahead. So this was done in um, Newmarket, UK. And the managing director of Jockey Club Estates said, with the help of our transport consultant and liaison through Suffolk County, we uh, produced a master plan to address all of the horse crossings and bring them to a consistent standard, making them safer for horses, riders, motorists, cyclists, and pedestrians. And they also went on to say that they partnered with uh, some of those groups too to make sure that um, they could even get more traction, you know, by uh, addressing the needs of more road users. But the Pegasus, as I understand it, still has, you know, dedicated road space for horse and rider separate from, you know, pedestrians and cyclists, which is not unusual. We have that here now too with modern um, crossings, urban crossings where pedestrians and cyclists have their own uh, demarcated space. Um, and this one, um, the leader there said after 10 years of advocacy, they got a new Pegasus crossing at Sandwell Valley County Park in the UK. And they also reduced the speed limit. So again, that's another thing. That's another measure here as they got this crossing and they reduced the speed limit from 60 miles an hour, which is pretty fast to 30, but they cut it in half. Um, and you can see there's also sort of a refuge area. Some of these, I believe, have a, sort of a staging area, basically a, an area if there's a queue um, for horse rider to wait as well. And then there's uh, principle five, which, which is modal shift, <clears throat> which is shifting more people out of cars because we know from all the research that uh, countries, cities, communities that have more cars have more injuries and deaths. So if we can get people traveling, um, in these other modes, walking, cycling, busing, of course, <laughs> uh, we can basically improve road safety just that way. Um, and we can also make it so that, you know, life is a little harder for cars like filtering, you can't get in certain roads. This is an example of filtering. You can walk or cycle through there, but you can't get a car through there or you just downright close a road, which we saw with the pandemic restrictions. Uh, we saw a lot of road closures that people uh, um, began to actually really like. Um, uh, and that some of them have remained, in fact. Um, and so, yeah, with just all kinds of measures, you can see, uh, you know, um, driver of, of a horse and cart, you know, could also be, is actually, right, a, another form of modal shift, um, going slowly, improving safety, almost acting like a pace car, 
you know, in slow incoming traffic. Hopefully there's not much traffic and the traffic's going slow. But um, so those are kind of the five urban principles. I know I'm going super fast, um, but, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about the rural road design principles as well. Um, and some of them have spillover, you know, but we want to make driving as simple as possible because we know people make mistakes and they can't handle a lot of complex decision environments. We want to keep drivers alert and focused because highway driving is a little bit different. You have to actually put a little more emphasis on that. You can get uh, more drivers that are falling asleep, not focused. Um, allow for normal human error and function to uh, reduce kinetic forces reduce the amount of moving energy released when things when it inevitably go wrong. So make driving simple, like make sure lane markings are bright. You can see in this one or, or um, they have uh, cat's eyes, which is the reflectors. Even wider markings are now a thing now moving from four inch to six inches in, in width. Or this flashing chevron that again, you know, just um, uh, really communicates that there's a curve up ahead and you have to reduce your speed. You know, access management is something to think about too, what engineers call access management. Like this is very poor access management, especially on the right, right? There is none. It's just a big open driveway. Cars can are leaving at any time. And you could sort of, you can see that being a pedestrian or riding a horse through this kind of environment, it's not good. Um, Here's a better example of access management where we've con tr put control and focus at one intersection. Um, and these sorts of things can, can guide us as well or around where we would want to put a crossing, uh, uh, including a horse and rider crossing. And in terms of um, uh, also, you know, um, uh, really communicating vividly a change in the road, you know, rather than just put up a sign that says, you know, you've had, the speed limit's dropped, you can have a gateway treatment um, that just changes the whole configuration of the road. It just vividly communicates that something uh, has changed. So making it simple for drivers, that's what the, one of the functions of the gateway. Uh, obviously keep drivers awake, and the rest stops are really good for that. Actually, there should be one about every 50 kilometers of highway based on US DOT research. Um, allow for normal human error, like, you know, rumble strips, longitudinal rumble strips that let you know you've departed the lane and they are highly effective. Now they're just default. For example, for the BC Ministry of Transportation, they will build any highway without these because their research is shown they're so effective and they're so cheap at the same time. Um, another one is speeds, you know, we talked about that earlier, but, you know, fundamentally under safe system principles, if you have vulnerable road users interacting with cars, they should never be higher than 30 K. It's not always the case, but that is how it should be. If we were serious about eliminating injury and death or serious injury and death, and then, you know, it depends on how you set speeds is based on the, on the crash configuration and the amount of injury that's possible. You know, it's not this 85th percentile. We'll see how cars, how fast they go and we'll adjust speeds up and down. But we look at what would happen if a, if a crash happens. So if, you, if, there's a, if there's potential for a side impact crash, it's 50K. If there's potential for a head-on crash, it's uh, 70 or maybe 80K. Um, and only when you don't have potential for any of that, you have a divided highway, et cetera, um, like this, would you have higher speeds? cable tension barrier that will, you know, uh, deflect cars, bring them back uh, even more effective than a concrete barrier. A vehicle strikes one of these cable tension barriers um, and it'll just be kind of thrown back into their lane again. Sometimes the airbags won't even go off. A little bit worse, what happens when you have a concrete barrier, but they're still effective, they reduce injury and death. Um, this is just another one um, from Ireland, you know, or a um, a crash attenuator so that the the ends of the barriers you know if you don't you don't hit the end of a barrier and with catastrophic catastrophic results there's a cushion there that there's all kinds of forgiving materials in there that will basically crumple just like your vehicle that's what we want we want your vehicle front end to crumple we want the uh, objects that is striking to uh, crumple 
so a lot of these features though, they don't really apply. Um, a lot of our highways are designed basically for, they're all designed, even if the, the best highway engineering is designed so that we could eliminate um, serious trauma to vehicle occupants, but it's really not about, there's really not a place for vulnerable road users on highways like this. There's not really a place. Um, and even, and, and sort of that, a good case for that is the clear zone. So this is an old concept, um, basically back in 1974, the whole idea that uh, where you might not have a roadside barrier to, to the side of the road, but you'd have a clear zone. So a vehicle leaves the roadway, drivers made some kind of mistake or maybe ice on the road, whatever. Um, and they don't, you know, strike a pole or a hard object or a tree that actually ends up in causing a fatal injury. They just glide through the space and their vehicle comes to a gradual stop. And this of course is one of the great safety um, 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 uh, discoveries that were, uh, that were made and that, were, um, that we really kind of um, started to do a lot more of since the 1970s. But then when you think about it, you know, we actually, sometimes we even design for pedestrians, cyclists, horses to be on that, to be on a shoulder, but essentially they're in the clear zone. Um, and it doesn't make, it doesn't make much sense. We know that if a vehicle on a highway like this were to strike people on the side of a road, whether they're pedestrians, cyclists, or on a horse, uh, the results will be catastroph catastrophic. Uh, and we know that. We know people will make errors we have over a hundred years of evidence to know that people make errors and they will keep making them every day. And we know that there'll be a crash at some point and it'll be catastrophic. There's lots going on here in this image. I mean, kind of the good, the bad, the ugly. I'll start with the good, that wearing high visibility clothing, actually, according to research done uh, on, on people wearing high visibility clo clothing on horses, it uh, reduces the odds of a collision significantly with an odds ratio of 0.2, so an 80% reduction. So that's awesome. And it looks like, um, um, you know, um, that's part of the message I think that's, that's being uh, portrayed here. But, you know, that road, that, does, that highway doesn't look that, it, I can't tell, this is just a photo, but it doesn't look like it's terribly low speed. There's also not much of a shoulder. I mean, a lot of roads are designed with even a road edge, um, which means that, it's, that it's, uh, the edge of the road is designed in such a way that if a vehicle errantly leaves it, they can actually get back up on the road again and actually uh, not uh, you know, travel into the ditch or hit a pole, but actually um, kind of make an evasive maneuver and get back onto the road. But you can see that there wouldn't even be um, latitude for that here. Uh, any kind of, there's no buffer, there, it, um, any kind of movement off the road uh, would be catastrophic. Essentially, there's no buffer and um, these riders are in the clear zone. The other thing I wanted to chat about was just um, the principles of road ecology before we kind of go on. We're actually doing pretty good here um, for timing, I think, 7.35. But we just thought we'd um, thought I'd cover a little bit about road ecology before we talk about okay, so what are some of the things that we could actually do to improve uh, equestrian safety? Um, so <clears throat> I think road ecology just has a bit of a. It was hard not to think about wanting to talk about road ecology just briefly because um, um, it is about uh, the the effect of transportation and roads on not just humans and safety, but on animals and species and the environment. So it's actually a pretty new field that just emerged in the late 1990s. And again, it's concerned about um, the impact of roads and the interrelationship between roads, vehicles, um, animals. Um, and it, and it's, it's, a, it's a huge topic, of course, um, because roads create all kinds of environmental pollutants, et cetera. And they, all, they create all kinds of um, uh, negative effects on other species. And of course, we want to reduce species loss. We have a, we're in a biodiversity crisis in the world. After climate change, our next biggest worry is 
the loss of habitat and loss of species. So, but even, even before that, you know, that ethically and morally, we want to preserve the number of species. Species obviously add richness and joy to the world. Um, and they also though, from an even practical point of view, provide direct services to humans, ecosystem services. Um, so, you know, animals that graze on grasslands create opportunities for new growth. You know, Charles Elton wrote Animal Ecology in 1927. We've understood this for a long time. And, and it contributed to understanding that animals create succession by showing that animals can create um, successional patterns of life through eating, dispersing, trampling, and destroying vegetation. Because we know in ecology that things have to get mixed up and destroyed in order for a new life to emerge. And we want movement of, of, um, of materials. In fact, many species that eat grasses and, veg and, and, and vegetation in one place and then defecate in another are actually helping to disperse seeds and plants through eco ecosystems. Um, and of course, there's birds, bats, bees, butterflies that are actually the pollinators. Um, so without getting too carried away, but this whole field of road ecology, I think is kind of applicable. Um, there's also the idea that, you know, roads create noise, which is probably not good for a lot of animals, very deleterious effects on birds, changes their song pitch, mating. Um, basically, it's a, an existential threat. And then there's the whole kind of, well, one of the things we can do that's really practical is make sure that we, have, we uh, address the problem of roadkill. In terms of wild animals, we can do that in a couple of ways, you know, put up a bit of a crossing or lower speeds. This is France. I think one of the things that's good here is that it looks like it's a lower speed road. Or uh, build wildlife crossings, overpasses and underpasses. And this is actually growing hugely now uh, in North America. Uh, this one's in Australia, but this next one here, you might recognize this one. This one turns 25 this year on the Trans-Canada Highway. It was built in uh, 1997. Uh, and they're building more. They're building another another uh, uh, one uh, outside the Banff National Park now. And they even build crossings for you know um, lizards, snakes, and toads in Canada. So it doesn't seem ludicrous to me that we, we should think about building tunnels and overpasses for horses and equestrians. Um, this one underpass on the A11 near Elvedon in uh, East. Anglia in the UK, and in their report, Advice on Road Crossings for Horses, the British Horse Society wants the underpasses, or if not possible, overpasses, to be the preferred crossing choice on any newly built road. And where it's not a newly built road, they recognize that it could be more costly, but they want the alternative than the, the Pegasus crossing structure. Um, and then that takes us to the last part, part six, <clears throat> which is ways to improve road safety for horses and riders. So we can see that, you know, it's important to recognize, you know, the road safety problem that we're all kind of uh, part of, that's a threat to all of us, that the safe system principles that apply, that are ironclad in terms of uh, how they work, you know, the principles for urban and rural, they all apply to um, horse and rider. Um, some road safety or road design takeaways might include, uh, I think the you know two big practical ones would be again to separate horse and rider from motor vehicle traffic through space and time, like dedicated trails, obviously, improved road crossings, and sometimes not even or but and uh, reduced vehicle speeds, not just you know with a changing the sign, but really doing it in a meaningful way effective methods like the gateways that we talked about, changing the road characteristics where possible, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, other ideas for improving safety um, might include, you know, a, some kind of a industry uh, road safety strategic plan for the sector, an advocacy strategy based on scientific evidence, you know, what kinds of things specifically um, are needed for change that, you know, that you members uh, would know about better than anyone. Um, another thing, uh, just kind of a thought really, just like we have safe routes for 
Safe Routes to School program. You could have a Safe Routes for Horses, building on the Horse Council BC Trails database, for example, you know, like a very methodical kind of um, effort to decide, you know, what constitutes a safe um, trail, a safe crossing, um, and encourage the use of those. Uh, perhaps building more safe trails in partnership with partnership funding. Uh, I just thinking about that when I was reading some of the examples, particularly in the UK, some of those were done by the Horse Society, but also in conjunction in partnership with government where some of the costs were, were shared. Um, and I think that you mentioned it in the road safety uh, manual that you produced, um, but a safe passing law. So we have them for like emergency vehicles, tow trucks, et cetera. But, and I think that um, I saw some of the work that Horse Council BC did with the uh, Ministry of Transportation around kind of raising awareness around safe passing, like this photo, for example. But there isn't actually a safe passing law that actually requires drivers to slow down a certain speed and give a certain berth when they see a uh, horse and rider. Um, a data strategy as well, like to actually make sure that data is captured. I was talking to Sarah, and I know she's thinking about that, how, how we actually can um, get information on what actual problems there are. And also a science-based strategy to educate motor vehicle drivers on what to do when they encounter horses. So it's similar, but you know, there's more that, than just um, uh, slowing down and giving the birth. There's also kind of recognizing horse behaviors, et cetera. And I thought the manual that you produce on road safety is really, really good. I really like it. It's also really kind of, um, you know, uh, to the point. It's not a huge long document, which I like, and uh, it has very concrete ideas. And actually when I read that, I thought, yeah, there's a lot there that I'm glad I read as a driver uh, next time I encounter a horse and rider on a, on a road. But that message probably could get out to more people. Um, and then when this study um, from Australia just made me think, they were looking at data and actually they just did an online survey of their members. Because when you think about your, you, the membership of Horse Council BC has lots of experience. You know, we don't actually have to go to databases to track accidents. We could actually just survey membership. Um, you could survey membership. Um, to find out, you know, what, what people are reporting in terms of like near misses, uh, mishaps or actual uh, collisions. And of course, there's this program, and I know that you've worked in partnership with the Ministry of Transportation on, about adding a sign. And, and they created these new tabs, these new bottom part messages like crossing, share the road, you know, next whatever kilometers, which are all good. Um, so that seems like a good step forward, being able to do that. I guess one other thing one could do is think about, you know, what are the criteria for creating, for having a, a, a sign, like, um, uh, or for having a designated route that would warrant a sign, or we, you know, to make sure that signs don't go up just anywhere or where there might not make much of a difference because speeds are too high. Um, so I'm not sure what, how much, um, uh, you know, opportunity would, there would be there for improvements, but just trying to throw out some ways of uh, some, some thoughts. Um, and in terms of the specifics of educating drivers, I know this is something too that Sarah was telling me about, you know, um, how we can make change through uh, educating motor vehicle drivers. And I think some things to think about are that um, it makes sense intuitively. You always have to keep in mind that the evidence to support education and awareness is low, but it's better when messaging is targeted and based on a theoretical model, like protection motivation theory, or, you know, you have to have a model, like not just the idea of, well, I'm just gonna uh, provide a message to people. Um, so there's some, um, some thinking uh, that can occur around there to make our messaging even more effective. And messaging is better when it's um, carried out in real time in place. So. Um, sorry, I just heard a little, that sound, I guess it's gone. So, you know, if you have just a generic message, you know, people aren't gonna remember it three months later, but you know, if you have it in real time, in real place, you know, like signs, um, that can't, signs when they're done right, can be better. Um, and better to be, better when it's done in tangent, 
in tandem with the changes to the road environment, or we actually create signs and routes where the road environment is conducive. But at the same time, it may be good, there may be opportunities for rural remote communities with largely local driving population as well, you know, where you can actually change the culture of driving. And you probably have had some success already with that kind of thing. And while education awareness can't solve the road safety problem completely, it can make a dent if it's done right. And therefore, it's still important to do. And I think that's it. Um, that's sort of the end of my presentation. Uh, and I covered a lot of stuff. So um, hopefully we can have a little bit of time now for, for questions or discussion. You want me to stop sharing my screen there, Sarah? Uh, sure, yeah, it looks like we have one question here already. Yeah. So I'm just gonna pop it up in the chat. Um, you can read it out. Um, so from Linda Phillips, um, she's just asking, do you have any advice for getting equestrian road safety considerations into road designs and official community plans in semi-rural communities. Our council has an allergic reaction every time infrastructure, which would protect vulnerable road users, is suggested because rural settings don't need such things. Any thoughts on that, Neil? Okay, yeah, good question, uh, Linda. I think, um, well, I think the one news story I read there from the UK, as I mentioned, um, they partnered with other groups, you know, because I, a lot of these measures um, will will improve safety for other road user groups as well. So I think that might be one tactic is sort of partnering with others. And, you know, and I, we know that when we improve vulnerable road user safety, including for horses and riders, it benefits everybody, even vehicle drivers. So I think because the principles of, you know, why wouldn't we make crossings more effective? Why wouldn't we re reduce speeds where we need to? So maybe there's that um, and that could help, but that's one thought. And then I think just continued persistence, you know, because um, as much as, I mean, road safety is not given the priority it should be given the size of the problem in my view. However, I have noticed that at the local government level, it actually is getting like where I live, for example, um, it is getting some attention now through, you know, persistent, I think um, uh, advocacy people making their views known and getting tired, quite frankly, of, um, of, of dangerous roads and where people are injured and killed. And so I think it is, it is slightly changing um, when you think about um, some of the changes that have happened in, in communities across BC. You know, we've seen speed reduction. We're actually seeing better crossings. We're seeing um, becoming a bit more political, getting political attention. So I think just persistence, never give up, continue to, to work on it. And um, those are two things. I'll keep thinking about that question though, if I think of some other things. Um, All right, perfect. Um, so maybe we'll move on to the next question. Um, we just have Jill Ackerman asking a question, um, saying Saanich in Victoria has terrific signage with speed limit quoted below. It would be nice to have this a uh, universal signage idea, do we contact our local government? Um, I'm not sure I understood that question, sorry. There is the, the Modi signage, which is universal. So mm -hmm. this question is about local government signage yeah. around horses and riders. Sounds like it's more so the municipalities she's thinking of. Okay. I don't know, I'm not sure I know, I mean the, um, all local governments pretty much use the Transportation Association of Canada guidance. So, and, and one of the things that's actually um, a standard is signs, right? Like uh, signs are actually pretty highly, there's a whole binder, it's pretty thick. And, you know, just engineers have a ton of discretion around a lot of things, but they don't have any around signs, you know, like a stop sign has to be red, has to be octagon in shape and all that. And I think the horse, so the signage should be pretty standard. Um, yeah, I'm not sure offhand what the issue might be. Like, are you seeing um, uh, different types of signs being used? Yeah, maybe Jill, do you want to just, did she clar clarify? Um, she says the horse signage is universal, but some signage has a speed limit under the horse sign. Oh, I see. Mm. Okay, I guess I think those are the tasks yeah. that, um, you can, they, like I know under the Modi uh, partnership that you have, right? They have these different mm -hmm. that can go. So I guess it depends on the context, um, it's my understanding. 
what's appropriate. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I have another question. Um, it's from Kathleen Ware. She says, at the end of the day, what can we do as an organization to help with any changes? Yeah, great question. Um, and I think that, uh, I mean, obviously, when I was looking on, on your website, there's lots going on. The trails program, the trails database, where people can, I think, I obviously couldn't get into it, but I understand there's the trails database where you kind of uh, capture information about trails and their characteristics, and like presumably how safe they are. And I saw that you do funding as well for some pro various projects, but one of the streams of funding was around trails, the building of trails. Um, so I think all of that um, is really great. Maybe there's opportunities to take it further. And I think that um, maybe opportunities to still, um, I don't know how much you've done around advocacy, but it's, it, does, it does pay off and it, it's, it, is, it is an instant, that's for sure. Um, but I think that you're, as an organization too, you have, you have strength of, you know, of, of membership and the fact that you're a, a credible organization. You can you've obviously done work, for example, with government. I saw that the news releases with Modi. So I think that continued, you know, advocacy, putting your voice forward um, for safety, um, you know, could, can go a long way. Um, and maybe thinking about, but thinking about that, you know, um, like how you want to do that, like almost, you almost need a, like a, a plan, an advocacy plan, like what, 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 is, what, what kinds of things do you want to do? What kind of changes, you know, where, because part of the problem in road safety, unfortunately, is we've inherited all this infrastructure from a, a century ago, that quite frankly, we've, we've thrown out a lot of the principles that were embedded back in the 50s, and we have entirely new ones today. But we've inherited billions of dollars of infrastructure, so there's a lot to change. Um, it's pretty, it's very, very hard to do, right? Um, so I think you have to kind of figure out what changes specifically you want to make. And I would look to examples like the British Horse Horse Society as well. You know, they've looked like they've been pretty successful in lobbying for changes uh, in a very thoughtful way. You're not going to change the whole province, but that's why I think maybe for your consideration, something like, you know, a, a safe um, trails program where you recognize certain trails as safe and then you make them even safer. Um, uh, you know, you focus your efforts uh, obviously in certain areas or maybe it's a, a law, you know, like you actually lobby for a, a, pay, uh, a safe passing law, you know, uh, again, the province has done that for emergency vehicles, et cetera. Don't see why I couldn't do one for equestrians and horses. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect, Neil. And yeah, um, I guess just to kind of chime in too, I, Kathleen, um, just with Horse Council and everything, I'm the recreation coordinator here and I've fairly, well, been in the role a year and a half or so, but um, yeah, definitely something I'm really wanting to dive into more is kind of working on advocacy and brainstorming more kind of advocacy projects and kind of hopefully roping in horse council members and people getting more local um, work done too. So yeah, we'll um, keep keep pushing for that. And um, yeah, something I definitely have to um, put some work into as well. Um, I just have a question from Pam Harrison here. She says, do you have any suggestions about bullying of riders aside from going to the police, which often or sometimes does not seem to be effective? Oh, geez, I don't know. I wish I had an answer for that one. Um, yeah, that's just so really tough. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the answer is, honestly. Um, that's when you get sort of the sort of rogue, like, you know, individual out there my gosh you know that's just one of the toughest things um you get people that are like you know with road rage or bullies um i think the only answer is to go to the police actually and you know it's great that we have phones nowadays um because we can capture we can get photos you know i think that that's your first line of defense sometimes when you see something is to actually record it and gather information and and re report it to the police I, I don't think there's any i can't think of anything else than been able to than doing that really. Okay, thank you for that, Neil. And then um, Brenda has a question. Um, she said, "Where would a person start to make a change 
For example, since you are from Victoria, Old Field Road is a frequent use by riders and dangerous due to speed, lack of any shoulder and non-rural traffic. And sorry, what was the first part of the question, Sarah? Um, she's just kind of asking where would a person start to make a change, how, how to make improvements to, I guess, Old Field Road. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, I think that's a good sign that, you know, um, you've identified the road. I mean, presumably, you, you know, it sounds like you, you know where the trails are that are safe, but there's obviously some places where you have to be on the road and you've identified, you know, where the biggest safety problems are, because you probably just know. You don't even have to, you just know. Um, but I think I, identifying those, um, uh, you know, and then and then creating kind of a, like, it may, I understand that Health or Council BC has sort of regions, right? So under, identifying what your top priorities are is a first step, uh, I might suggest. So if that's one of them, right, Old Field Road, then I think it's just a matter of, you know, putting together a, a really good um, argument um, again, with advocacy, but also, you know, with, with some evidence. And I think that's where you could do like an online survey, perhaps, but you could gather some data, right, on the, the extent that there's a problem. And that can be not just, you know, obviously injuries and, and crashes are problems, but near misses are, count as well. But when people are uncomfortable, when they, you know, they feel, because if a road is dangerous, then people don't want to use it. And we all have a right to use the road, right? Um, so I think um, amassing a bit of data, and it doesn't have to be scary data. It can be, again, it could be survey results. It could be um, among members, for example, but gather some facts and information about that road. Um, and of course you can even go out, you know, in a safe place and record vehicle speeds and stuff like that. You can gather kind of site specific information. It's not too hard. Um, and then just be really clear. I think it helps to have the backing of the cap of your society or your your uh, region or district, you know, and that and that you have sort of a bit of an organization behind you. Um, and then to really kind of advocate advocate for the, some changes, you know, thinking clearly about what you want to see, you know. Um, often it's speed reductions, for sure, but it might be some you know roadway characteristics that you want to see changed as well. Um, and then, yeah, be prepared to be persistent about some lobbying efforts or advocacy efforts. All right, um, I have another one here from Linda Phillips. Um, she's asking if you can share um, links to the UK infrastructure adaptations for horses and riders, um, mm -hmm. the tunnel, the controlled crossings. Um, yeah, do you have that handy, Neil, or do you want me to send that? I can maybe send that out to um, the registered um, webinar participants after, maybe. Sure, that'd be great. I mean, you have the same. Yeah. You have the document. Yeah, right. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll send. Um, Linda will send out um, yeah. kind of more information on that after. Uh, and right. I'll send you what I have, Sarah. Um, oh, perfect. Anything else that you don't? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um. All right, Susan Moore, um, question from her. Um, could Horace Council be more proactive with municipal and provincial governments to make rural roads safer? Um, I guess I will answer this one here. Um, so yeah, I believe, like I definitely wanna do some more work, um, definitely on a provincial level, I would say, um, advocating and maybe trying to, you know, ask kind of government for more money for infrastructure improvements. Um, municipal, it does get a little bit trickier um, just because there are so many municipalities in BC, but um, we find with advocacy work, it's great if it comes kind of from like a local and then like I'm more than happy though to like jump on board and, you know, like write a letter of support to support your efforts and everything like that. Um, but unfortunately I can't be all over the province and every municipality, but um, definitely on a provincial level, I'm going to work on that um, more. And um, yeah, any locals that really want to take the reins kind of on their municipalities. And if they need support, you can certainly reach out to me. Um, and yeah, we can definitely work together um, on that. Um, all right. 
Um, we have some more questions coming in. We are at eight o'clock, so um, we might not be able to get to all of the questions tonight, um, but we're just gonna see what else is here. Um, so Linda Phillips just said, perhaps Horse Council BC needs to partner with ICBC on changing car culture around road safety for horses and riders as vulnerable road users. Yeah, I think, um, oh, sorry, Neil, just maybe um, just meant answer this one. Just, um, yeah, I think working maybe with ICBC as well, um, kind of getting a, some contacts there would be maybe a helpful thing to help kind of with education. Um, okay. And this one's from Sue Cloakid. Well, I'm seeing a lot, a lot more come through. Um, maybe what we'll do, just because there seems to be a lot of questions. Um, Jocelyn, is there something that we can um, capture, like the questions, and then send out email answers to people after? Is that a possibility? Yeah, it'll all be saved. Um... To the chat so i can send them to you after and then we can get our answers in. okay um, yeah because i think there's another like 12 messages here so um just to not take up too much of everybody's time and everything tonight um we'll maybe go with that and then um send out those those answers and everything to everybody um yeah and i think on my end just had some kind of closing remarks here um, so yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody for attending the presentation and I hope you gain some insights on the presentation on how roadways can be improved and in increasing um, safety for equestrians. Um, we also hope that this presentation inspires you to take some action and be an advocate, advocate for road safety um, where you ride. Um, yeah, and thank you, Neil, so much for taking the time out of your evening. I really appreciate that. Um, being here to present for us and share your knowledge. It was, it was really great. Um, yeah, and thanks to all of the people who joined the webinar. And yeah, everybody have a good evening. And um, yeah, we will send out some more information to you um, afterwards as well. So, okay, thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Hope you enjoyed it and got something out of it. Perfect. Thanks, guys.